everyone. It's wonderful to have you here today to worship the Lord. Some of you might have your nose out of joint because I didn't shake your hand. I apologize. I am fighting a cold. So if you want the day off of school or a paid day off of work, come give me a hug after the service. But I am going to maintain a circle of safety. So please forgive me. I will not shake your hand today. A um, couple of quick announcements. Of course, Clarence Nickel, we celebrate his life on Friday. He's gone home to be with the Lord, so do pray for Joyce and the family as they adjust to this new season of life without uh, this godly, wonderful man. Even as a church, we, he hasn't been around the last couple of years, but uh, he's been in touch with many of us, so do pray for them. Continue to pray for Bill Reisner. He's recovering from a fall that he had. Uh, Catherine Keating also, who had her leg amputated below the knee. Uh, for Jim Mills as well, and for Laura. And uh, there's a number of folks on the back of your bulletin. And, uh, you know, be intentional and, uh, and take some time to pray for those as the Lord leads you. A couple of announcements as well to, to uh, share with you. Next Sunday we'll be uh, following our Sunday service. We're going to have a potluck luncheon here at the church. And it's sort of a launch of our Operation Christmas Child Ministry. It has begun, and you can see there's a number of boxes at the back. If you struggle with uh, uh, putting the, the, the box together, the, I saw Dominic, Brother Dominic, spending forever back there putting them together like a construction worker, so they're good to go. If you prefer an unfolded one, <laughs> they're also available back there. But next Sunday, we're going to have our, our launch of that ministry. So do bring along something to share and something for yourself. Uh, and sign up at the back just so we have an idea of numbers of who's going to be here. So that's for next Sunday. Uh, tonight we have a Henley concert. It is Mission 4. I want to keep saying Mission 5, but it's Mission 4. And uh, from what I've been told, they are excellent. So if you're able to, please attend that. And before I forget, Happy Thanksgiving! <laughs> You know, there's a lot of turkeys out there, and, there, and I'm not just talking about the ones on your table. So it's good to have you here. Let's just open in a quick word of prayer, please. Our loving Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day morning, the day of the week where we just rest from the activities of life, if we were able to, to remember your beloved Son. We thank you for that Sunday so many years ago where he was raised from the dead following the events of that Friday where he gave his life on the cross for us. We thank you now for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that you are long-suffering and patient, that all would come to repentance. And we thank you that we are counted among those who have repented, who have sensed the Holy Spirit in our lives, who now indwells us, who has brought us to an understanding, conviction, and a knowledge, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we thank you for that this morning. So as we gather together to worship in song, in prayer, in meditation, in the children's program and, and through the service and through the ministry of your word, Lord, we pray you would be pleased, you'd be glorified, you'd be honored above all else in our lives. For the sake of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, on a Thanksgiving Sunday morning, we have selected for us to start our service a wonderful, wonderful hymn. Isaac Watts has given it to us. And he identifies throughout the words of this song some of the wonderful blessings our powerful and mighty God provides for us every single day. And uh, for every good gift that comes from our Heavenly Father, we thank him today. So welcome to the Thanksgiving service. And if you're here visiting with us, well, we want you to feel right at home. Part of that comes along with singing. So why don't you find a, a hymn book if you need one, number 59. The words will be on the uh, screen for us. I sing the mighty power of God, and if you're able, let's stand.
key verse this morning is from Matthew 26 and 39, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Let's pray. Our loving Father, this verse reminds us again the depths of Christ's love for us and his obedience toward the Father. We thank you again that Jesus Christ came into this world to lay down his life as a ransom, to save his people from their sins, and that he had the power to lay down his life and to pick it up again, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And no scheme of man nor of Satan could buffet him or stop him. And we thank you that he's alive at your right hand, and that is the power of the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for sinners, was buried, and was victoriously raised from the dead as the first fruits, as the resurrection and the life and the hope of all of his people. So as we gather now, we worship you, the living God, in the name of your Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. How great 
is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Praise the Lord. I ask you to stand, please. Treasure. 
My steering wheel was cold this morning. So I want to hear some clapping. I want the uh, other churches around us to hear us. That's it. Uh, dump, two, three, four, and pick it to cut on it. One, two. Thank you for this morning. As the ushers come forward, we ask that you would bless our time here. Bless uh, the week that's coming. Keep us safe in all that we do. And we thank you for how you provide for us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
When that shoe box is open, they're overjoyed. You can see them shouting, jumping. Oh, look at how much they are excited. This is the first time those children are receiving the shoe boxes. They are so happy. You can hear the laughter. You can hear the cheer. That excitement, it goes and goes and goes. Right now, we're in Ukraine, and today we've given out the 200 millionth shoe box to a little girl here, so it's a lot of fun. It's a privilege for us to be able to come and to help the people as much as we can. Every box is important, because every box is an opportunity to tell a child about God's love, about His Son, Jesus Christ. There's so much joy that one gift box can give. They really experience the love of Jesus. Christmas show, we celebrate something as simple as the shoe box because God uses it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We got a full box on this team. This is such an amazing time. We're so happy to be here. This shoe box gift will impact a child's life all year round. We never dreamed we'd have an army of men and women who would come to make this program happen. This is what it's all about. Telling others about Jesus. These shoe boxes go into 120 different countries where pastors and missionaries are going to use them to bring the gospel to kids. So you may think it's just a simple gift at Christmas time, but it's the gift of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. When that shoe box leaves that distribution center and it goes around the world, that's not just one person. That's the body of Christ joined together, delivering the good news of the gospel. They go by plane, they go by ship, they go by riverboat, they go by camels, they go by motorbikes. And these boxes go to some of the most remote areas of the world. And every box counts. After receiving shoe boxes, children are invited to participate in the Greatest Journey Discipleship Program. These children have just completed 12 lessons in the greatest journey. I believe that discipleship is the key and they are now followers of Christ. They will tell their friends about Jesus. My name is Gladys and I am nine years old. My friend Kemi told me I needed to go with her to church. I wanted to teach her about the word of God. And when she came to my church, 
she received a gift box. For a long time, I asked my mom for a blanket. When I opened my shoe box, I found a blanket in it. When I came home, I showed it to my mom, and she said it was great. I told her about Jesus. Now me, my mom, my grandma, and Kemi go to church together. I am certain of one thing. God is my savior. Every box counts. Every box touches a child. It's like a snowflake. There's not one shoebox that is the same. And we are reaching millions of children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you get the heart of the child, you will reach the heart of the parents, you will reach the heart of the family, and then you will touch the community. We are seeing churches being planted, and more and more churches are being built. We will do whatever it takes to reach the ends of the earth with the gospel. That gift box is the beginning into their hearts. Isn't it incredible how these gifts touch the lives of these children? The joy, the smiles, it changes lives. Every year we see tens of thousands of children discipled. And we couldn't do this without you, so thank you for packing the boxes. Thank you for praying for these children around the world. God bless you, and keep packing those boxes. Good morning. Kids, I'm so glad to welcome you here to church this morning on Thanksgiving Sunday. It's wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, you know, today I'm going to need your help, kids. All right, so I am going to do my very best to give some instructions, but I need you to help me out by listening really carefully. And uh, Pastor Bobby's going to help out too with what we're going to do this morning because we have something special for Thanksgiving Sunday today. For the past few weeks, ever since the beginning of September, do you remember how we've had the easels at the back of the sanctuary? And we've been encouraging everybody to come and write down their, their praises and their thanksgivings. And we were going to collect them this Sunday. And so we have all of those pages rolled up and tied up. So they're rolled up into a scroll. And what, kids, I'd like you to help us out with this morning is, in just a minute, I'm going to have anybody who wants to help out, go to the back where Pastor Bobby is. Wave, Pastor Bobby. There he is. He's got the scrolls, and he's going to give out the scrolls to you kids. Now, I've got seven scrolls, so some of you, there might be more kids than scrolls, and that's okay. You can all go to the back. Get the scrolls, and when everybody's got a scroll, Mr. Jurgen's going to be playing a song called We Bring the Sacrifice of Praise. And when that song is being played, we're all going to sing it if we know it. And kids, you're going to carefully walk up the aisles, and we're going to bring those scrolls like we're bringing a sacrifice of praise. All right? It's, it's a collective praise from everybody who is here. And kids, I know that some of you even wrote down praises on there because I recognized some of the things you were saying. And so we're going to bring those up to the front, and we're going to put them here in our basket, right up at the prayer altar. You know, we don't always have the prayer altar here because we use this lower stage a fair bit. And we don't want anybody, you know, tripping or anything. But today we have it here because we're going to bring our praises as an offering, as a sacrifice. And we're going to lay them here um, at the front. And then, kids, you're welcome to stay up front here for just a minute after we've done that because we're going to all sing the doxology together. And then, kids, we're going to offer a special Thanksgiving prayer to the Lord, and we'll need your help for that as well. So if there's any Disciple Land kids that want to right now get up, go back to Pastor Bobby. Good. Yes. That's it. Lead by example. There we go. Great. Go back to the back there. Get a scroll. If you don't have a scroll, that's okay. You can still join in the procession to come back up. Your hearts have Thanksgiving in them. That's it.
yourself. to stand and we're going to sing the doxology. Feel free to add some parts if you know them. Let's really raise the roof off of this place, okay? Disciple Land program, we've been studying some psalms, and this morning during our offering time, did you recognize Psalm 8? Do you remember? For he has ordained praise from the mouths of infants and children because of his enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. We drew a pirate, remember that? Well, this morning, kids, we're going to offer a, pr a prayer of praise to God, and it's going to be an echoing prayer. So kids, you're kind of spread everywhere, and that's okay. Maybe we'll invite the grown-ups to help us out so that we'll get some good, you know, oomph here. But we're going to pray, and I'm going to mention some of the things. I kind of have them grouped in categories. Praises that, that people wrote down here on our scrolls, and we're going to say them out loud to God. And then your part, kids, and anybody else who wants to join in, is I'll, I'll do a little pause. I'll say something we're thankful for, do a little pause, and then you say... We thank you, Lord. All right, can we just practice your part? All right, ready? One, two, three. We thank you. One more time. Ready? One, two, three. That's the way. Yeah, so we're going to do that. And then at the very end, we'll, we'll say amen. And then kids, if you want to come to Disciple Land today, you can come with me, okay? Let's close our eyes and let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with hearts full of thanksgiving for your many blessings and your provisions in our lives. And right now, we want to thank you specifically for just these blessings that you've given to us, for the world and the beauty of nature that we can enjoy. We thank you, Lord. Ready? We thank you, Lord. For our families and friends and for homes and for food that we eat every day, we thank you, Lord, for this church family and for the church worldwide, for all of the people who love you. We thank you, Lord, and for the people in this local church who give their time and they volunteer and work so hard to serve one another. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for our bodies and for medicines and for doctors and for um, assistive technologies that can help us. We thank you, Lord. And we thank you too for play and leisure and time to rest and enjoy each other's company. We thank you, Lord. And above all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And we thank you that our sin can be forgiven and we have a home in heaven waiting for us one day. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, you can join me in Disciple Land if you'd like. Well, good morning, church. 
We are in the book of Exodus, continuing on now in chapter 4. And the Lord God has revealed himself as the great I am to Moses. And so beginning in verse 1, we pick up on this conversation, chapter 4, verse 1. If you're able to, please stand for the public reading of God's word. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff. Then he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand in your bosom. And so he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, Put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Then Moses said to Yahweh, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord, Yahweh? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, send the message by whomever you will. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently, and moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth, and I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform the signs. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Our loving Father, we thank you again for this opportunity, this great blessing of gathering around your word as a worshipful act. We pray now that you would bless its public reading, that Christ be magnified and glorified here this morning on this platform, and I would simply decrease. Father, we pray your blessing on the, the balance of this service for your glory, and for the sake of Christ we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As much as I can identify with the impetuosity of the Apostle Peter in the New Testament, of all the qualities and life experiences of Moses in the Old Testament, the ones I can identify with most is his hesitation, his reluctance, and even at times Moses' disobedience. Long before I came to Glenridge Bible Church, I was approached and asked if I'd ever considered preaching. That just seemed to be a pattern of the assembly of the church we were in. They would seek out younger men who may have a gift in preaching the Word of God. And if that gift is confirmed, it is then affirmed, and further development of that gift begins. It began very simply with Sunday night meetings. And I'll never forget, I spoke on the Beatitudes. I had written out verbatim, which is something I still do today if you ever see my notes, and no, I don't usually share them because they're private to me in some ways, but if you want to see them, you can see them. But I typically write out verbatim what I'm going to see, adding and subtracting as the Holy Spirit leads me on a Sunday morning. But that first Sunday night, dressed up like in a suit at, like I was going to a funeral, 
I read my notes verbatim and monotoned, never once looking up at the congregation. And yet, there was something in that that the elders saw the gift of preaching. And they confirmed it and affirmed it. And it began with that Sunday night. It was smaller in attendance. It presented somewhat of a non-threatening, patient audience that encouraged me and shared with me some of their experiences, speaking of the elders and the men who were preachers, in presenting the scriptures. It was really an environment to present an opportunity for coaching. That then developed into a traveling Sunday morning ministry. I traveled all over southern Ontario. I went back home to Manitoba and preached in my mother's church. Uh, I've been to British Columbia, to Halifax, and into the United States. I have preached at conferences, cap, ca camps, crusades, everything from tent meetings to open air preaching. These were all scheduled into my calendar. And then, unexpectedly, really, Though in hindsight, I could see I was already on this journey. The Lord was preparing me for this journey. I was called to ministry here by someone you might know named Dave Yancey, who asked me if I would consider coming to pastor here at Glenridge. But when that initial ask, way back when, at the old assembly took place, I resisted. I resisted the call to Glenridge. But back then, I was extremely reluctant for a number of reasons. Like Moses who am I to do something like that? Why would I want to do that? You know, you know what, does, what, what do a lot of Christians love for lunch on a Sunday morning, Sunday after service? Roasted preacher. Oh, they love that. Preachers are usually and routinely and oftentimes illegitimately challenged or misquoted or misunderstood without any opportunity for clarification. At times, we're insulted. We have our character attacked. Pastors are easy scapegoats for a reason to leave a church. Preachers are typically, uh, display pouring hours and hours of study into our sermon prep. Believe it or not, I don't only work one day a week. They're criticized for their messages, and we often hear complaints about the length of the sermon. It's too long. This one's only 74 minutes, so you'll be okay today. Or it's too short. It didn't speak to me, and so on and so forth. Now, why would I want to subject myself to that kind of abuse? So believe me, I can, and I know a lot of pastor, preacher, elders who can relate to Moses' initial reluctance. But then we read in the text, and I've experienced this, and I know many other uh, uh, pastors and preachers and elders have, have experienced this countless of times, the equipping, the anointing of the Lord, and his assurances of his immediate presence when you rightly handle the word of God. That he will empower his chosen instruments for the tasks of handling God's word publicly. And we were reminded, and I'm always reminded, who it was that made my mouth. You know, Moses has encountered the living God, holy and set apart. And the first call to Moses from last week, if you'll remember, was the call to the kingdom, which we experience through the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, the call to repentance and a belief in Jesus Christ. That's the, that initial call to the kingdom of heaven. That's what Jesus preached. For Moses, it was a return practically, physically, to be a part of the children of Israel for this ex exiled ex Egyptian prince. It was time to go back to the kingdom, the earthly kingdom of God's people. But then there is this call to service. That though it was the Lord's prerogative to save, and it's always the Lord's prerogative to save, and it's the Lord's power that saves and sustains that salvation. He does, through, he does so through his chosen instruments, which in this case was Moses himself. Today, it's through the ministry of the word, gospel preaching through his people, the church. Now God's about to send Moses back to his people so that God may deliver them. 
He has heard their cry. He is fully aware of what his people are suffering through. And now was the time for God to remember, not that he is somehow deficient in his memory, but we talked about that last week, that he remembers them and that he is now about to act. That's what it means when God remembers. He is about to act. He's about to directly intervene in the affairs of mankind. And so he's going to send Moses back to his people so that God may deliver them from the bondage they were suffering through the hands of Pharaoh. But Moses has some serious reservations. And those doubts revealed themselves in four statements of reluctance. The first was, who am I? Who am I to bring out the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Well, first of all, that's the wrong question. He's the instrument. It is God who is going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. But he asks, who am I? So then God assures Moses that he wasn't going alone. The Lord would go with him. And that, and that one of the major signs of God's presence was the burning bush itself. Then Moses resists by saying that, that he doubts the children of Israel are even going to listen to him. Well, who am I? Okay, you know what? They're not going to listen to me. To which God responds by revealing his name. I am that I am. We discussed that last week. The God of your fathers. And this is the name of God. I am that I am. The God of, the fa of your fathers. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is God's name. Moses is assured that the God of his ancestors that called out Abraham, sustained Isaac, and wrestled uh, with Jacob, and changed his name to the very nation of which Moses is descended from, Israel, Moses is assured that this God of his ancestors is the one before him and is the one who will go with him into Egypt. And then further assures him that at least the elders in Exodus 3, 16 to 18, the, the elders are going to believe you. So there's, there's at least those men who would, who would, who would support Moses. And God goes on to further assure him that he would be with him and the elders would believe him by also saying that he would stretch out his hand and perform miracles that will reveal to Egypt that he is the one true God and that the children of Israel are his people. Which takes us to Moses' third objection, his, his third statement of reluctance. That despite all those assurances of chapter 3, Moses still remains skeptical still resisting uh, God's call in his life to serve him. In verses 3 to 6, we have these incredible signs. They're supernatural. They cannot be explained. And they cannot be understood by the natural man. That Moses has a rod, and he places it on the ground, and it turns into a snake. That he puts his hand into his cloak and then pulls it out and it's withered like a, like a leprous hand. That it's like snow. That it's, it's like flaking. And puts it back in and then pulls it out again and it's healed. The fact that he's speaking to the presence of God in a burning bush is a miracle, a sign of itself. These are all symbolic. There's deeper meaning to the signs. The snake is striking. Because it was the it was the the the, the de facto god of, of Lower Egypt, the serpent god. And and Pharaoh's Pharaoh's headdress actually had a, a, a snake on it, a serpent. By throwing the rod down and, and having it turn into a snake, God is showing his sovereignty and his rule even over Pharaoh, who is considered a, a man god. And as Moses recoils and runs in fear, God says, this is, my, this is my power. This is my sovereignty. Grab it by the tail. And he grabs it. It's a picture of God's complete control over even Egypt, the greatest dynasty, the greatest empire on the face of the earth in this day. And then the leprous hand. That's, that's, a, that's an ominous picture. That's a picture of, 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 of a divine punishment, a divine judgment about to come upon Egypt. And then you have the preview of the first plague. 
take some water out of the Nile, pour it onto the dry ground, and I will turn it into blood. And that first plague speaks of all ten plagues. That there is judgment coming to Egypt. That God will free his people. But despite those signs, and despite God's assurances, Moses goes so far to even say in verse 13, please, Lord, now send the message by whoever you will. He's basically saying, no, I'm not going. It's a picture of almost like a little child, like, you can't make me. And my response as a parent is, oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> and that always reminds me of something. I have to share this little story is that Sometimes children think they're so wise and smart and saying, well, if you hurt me, I'm going to call the police. Go ahead, it'll be 10 minutes before they get here. Well, Moses is going to say, no, send somebody else. That's one of the key differences when we compare Moses and Jesus Christ. You know, when we encounter the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see a a resolute commitment and obedience to the will of the Father by God the Son. Even in the face of the enormity and loved ones, we can enter into an understanding, a complete understanding of what Jesus was stepping into when he, when he prayed and sweat drops of blood. That's a physiological response to extreme stress. A stress now of Isaiah 53 coming to pass that he is going to be led like a sheep to the slaughter. The enormity of what Jesus was about to do in his humanity first, in his humanity. And so yes, we do hear Jesus pray. Father, if there's any other way, if there is any way that we can get by the horrors of the cross... We would expect that in, in, in the humanity of Jesus. This is the fullness of his perfect humanity on display. No one in their rational mind, so therefore Jesus was not a lunatic, liar, lunatic, or lord, as C.S. Lewis famously said. You've only got those three choices. He was not a lunatic because no one seeks out physical torture, especially to the extent of crucifixion. And so it makes perfect sense, Jesus being a sane man perfectly in his mind, would pray this way, if there's any other way. He was fully human without sin, and he understood, he knew what waited for him on that cruel Roman cross. A level of human torture and agony that is foreign to all of us today. He would have no doubt witnessed the crucifixion process during his lifetime. So the prayer request of his father makes total sense in light of that. As the dark shadow of the cross was beginning to engulf him, it was for this purpose that he came. But that leads us to a deeper theological reason for Jesus' prayer. It wasn't reluctance. Jesus wasn't reluctant. It wasn't reluctance that moved Jesus, the Lord Jesus, to pray this way. It was nothing like Moses' reluctance to God's call in his life to save his own people. Moses resisted. And as I said in verse 13, he flat out refuses God's command to be used that's why the Lord's anger burned. That's not, that term is not used very often in the entire Bible. But it burned against Moses because he so steadfastly refused. Even though he had the comfort and assurances that God had partially fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant of descendants, therefore he was a faithful God, now it was time to fulfill the land component of the covenant. And the Lord assured Moses that at least the elders would believe, with, uh, would believe in him. And, and the great promise, Moses wouldn't be alone. God would be with him. But still Moses resists. And that's one of those glaring differences between Moses and the Lord Jesus Christ. Moses resisted despite the assurances 
Jesus submitted to the salvific plan of the Godhead, especially in the fullness of his perfect humanity and divine consciousness. He knew that there was set before him a joy in Hebrews 12 and 2, but he must first endure the cross. He knew that. Jesus prayed that way in the garden because he knew the reality of what, was, of what he was about to willingly and obediently experience on behalf of his people. He was about to enter, and this is the deeper theological significance. He was about to enter to the fullness. Now listen closely. Into the fullness of God's righteous wrath and judgment. To be sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. That was the fullness of that cup of suffering that he was going to experience. Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathani. That is the fullness of Christ's suffering. My God, my God, why? I can never finish that. Why have you forsaken me? Eternal events were set in motion that would eventually end in Jesus' death on the cross. And Jesus knew that. And that is why he prayed. But that prayer was qualified, wasn't it? With Jesus' desire, his obedience and his desire to fulfill his Father's will. If it was possible, Jesus prayed, let the cup pass, but not my will, but the Father's be done. Well, in much the same way, Moses had some assurances from God. The elders would listen, the Lord would be with him, the signs he would perform, the burning bush itself, turning Moses' shepherd's staff into a snake, the miracle of the hand, and so on. But he still, with, he, he, ref, he, he refuses. The Lord Jesus had the assurances of the Father. The knowledge that the Father was pleased with him. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He knew that the Father would be glorified by his death and eventual resurrection, John 17, 4-6. And the Lord Jesus would return to that glory that he had beforehand. He had that assurance. Jesus rested in the power of his authority over life and death with the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. That no one takes his life from him, John chapter 10 and 18. And the powerful promises and the assurances of the Old Testament scriptures that after his death, a death the Lord God was pleased in, Isaiah 53 and 10, Jesus the Lord knew that the Father would not allow his Holy One to be abandoned to Sheol or allow his body to to decay, Psalm 16 and 10. He had those assurances that even after having his hands and feet pierced, his heart melting within him and lying in the dust of death, he knew his father would hear him, Psalm 22, 13 to 24, and would raise him up again. And all of this would satisfy his father and Isaiah 53, 11, justify many. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of man, never resisted his father's plan for his life. Moses did. What he failed to realize is that the salvation of the children of Israel was never going to be realized by any power Moses had. That was evident throughout Moses' reaction to the signs that God performed, the bush, the rod, the leprosy. The text intimates that Moses fully acknowledges that God is sovereignly in control of all of these things. He failed to realize, however, that it was the power of God through him that would accomplish this monumental salvific event in the history of Israel. And I can't help as I evaluate my own life how much more effective I would be if each of us would be if we stopped resisting 
God's will for our lives. It begins with that call to holiness. We compromise. We are called to be set apart from the world, truly reflecting the glory of God in a dark, dead world. But we compromise and we resist. Subtly, but we resist. It could be an area of our lives that the Lord is convicting us on. Some sin. Something we justify. Something we know is contrary to God's word, but we apply some type of modern logic in an attempt to circumvent eternal truths so we can silence any conviction we are experiencing. And so we resist. It could be an area of personal ministry. Each of us are called to evangelize in our circles of life. Each one of us is called to preach the gospel, not just the pastor and not just the preacher, but whatever it is, we need to recognize that if the Lord has truly called us to make a move and it's consistent with the word of God, the Lord told me to have an affair. No, he didn't. The Lord told me to steal that $100,000 from that corrupt company. I highly doubt that because it's not consistent with God's word. So as we are called, we recognize that if the Lord has truly called us to make a move, whatever it is, whatever area of our life, whatever, whatever corner of our lives it is, and it's consistent and upheld by his word, we need to trust him. As difficult as the task is, this is where perspective, perspective's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We always say hindsight's 20-20. Perspective's a wonderful thing. Now, I'm not trying to minimize whatever it is that's happening in our individual lives, but let's be real. Let's be real here. No one here, no one here is being asked to be the rod of salvation and the instrument of God's deliverance for hundreds of thousands of kinsmen from the hand of a repressive regime, are we? If you are, I'd love to talk to you after. I know a guy. He's got white coats. He'll take you away. None of us are being called to what Moses was called to. But what we are called to is to serve as a rod of salvation for the lost in an unseen spiritual war. God has called us to that. God has called us to preach the gospel. He has called us to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, to make disciples. He has called us to holiness, and the list goes on. And the question is, are we and loved ones, I'm part of the equation. I'm part of the evaluation, the self-evaluation. Are we collectively, including the funny-looking guy standing in front of you, are we resisting? You know what we like to do? We like to make excuses. Who here makes excuses all the time, eh? My finger hurts, Laura, I can't do the dishes. Well, we, maybe we excuse ourselves from whatever it is by saying we're unqualified. Who am I? They're not going to listen to me. I'm slow of speech, slow of tongue. But are we truly unqualified? Now, there's some areas we might be legitimately unqualified. We can acknowledge that. It's not a bad thing to respond initially in humility. Maybe even disbelief at what God intends for us to do uh, for him. When, when Pastor Dave talked to me about coming here, I resisted, I was in disbelief, I was hesitant. It's, as a matter of fact, reluctance is, that initial reluctance is, is really a perfectly normal reaction. And the struggle in our call to serve him can actually prepare us. That struggle can prepare us for the works that, uh, that's ahead of us. What I've come to realize over time is if we take a moment and evaluate our lives leading up to those nexus events, we'll call them, those, those, those moments where God has called us to something specific, the Lord has typically called us to an area of service that in hindsight, again, perspective, 2020, we can see how God had been preparing us for that over a period of time before he even called us. 
In Moses' case, it was shepherding Jethro's flocks. Before that, it was living in Pharaoh's house. Before that, it was the salvation experience of that little baby mini ark. God had been preparing him for 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert, for 40 years of direct ministry with an obstinate, difficult, grumbling, complaining people that oftentimes forgot who their God was. And it's like that for us. We look back and we see, oh my goodness gracious, look how God's been preparing me for this. And I didn't even see it. Moses hasn't realized yet that God has been preparing him. He's been tutoring him. He's been training him for the task at hand of shep- uh, just from going from shepherding sheep to shepherding his people. There's areas we've been called to in order to be successful during a time of preparation. The Lord further equips us. And for Moses, he was then convinced, another excuse, I'm not an elegant speaker. Now some, and I sort of, I lean this way, but this isn't, you don't have to be dogmatic about this. This ain't a hill I'm going to die on. But I think after 40 years out in the countryside, he's probably lost this, uh, this, any superior command he had on the Egyptian language. You know, when my mom comes to visit, and those of you who know, my mom is deaf. My first language, and therefore why my hands are always moving, is American Sign Language. That's my first language. But when she's away, if I, or if I haven't spoken to her in a couple of weeks, and we get on the phone, we get on the computer and start talking, one of the things she always says is, your ASL sucks. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. She can say that because she's Mom. Because I'm not consistently using it. Well, maybe that was what happened to Moses. Maybe, you know, being away for 40 years, he's lost his command of Egyptian. That, that's what I think, but it doesn't matter. Maybe he'd stuttered. The Septuagint kind of hints that he stuttered. Again, we're not sure. Or he felt like he didn't have the diplomatic skills that would be needed to be in the presence of Pharaoh. Well, he grew up in Pharaoh's home, so he's already got that credibility, so I don't think that's it. But whatever the reason, legitimate or little illegitimate, what he, and, and we need to realize this, uh, it's just like Moses, God displays his might by working through weak and ordinary means. We do know at the end of 40 years of wandering in, in, the, in the desert, Moses did develop into quite a dramatic public speaker. But at this point in time, and yes, it was primarily through Aaron, but he was a dynamic public speaker at times. But at this point in time, Moses considered it a glaring weakness in his abilities to communicate and therefore accomplish what God was asking of him. You know who else was not a great speaker? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not an impressive public speaker. It says in 2 Corinthians 10.10, his critics say his letters are weighty and straight and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive, his speech contemptible. He even says to the Corinthian church, when I came to you, I came in trembling and fear. So how did he respond? He responded by preaching a preaching style that was plain, it was straightforward, and it's centered on Jesus Christ and the gospel. He preach Christ crucified. You know, sometimes we say, I don't know what to share with some. What am I supposed to say to the lost? You know, they're screaming at me. If they're screaming at you, walk away. But if they're open and they're listening, and there's some level of sane communication between the two of you, just Preach the gospel. Preach is just communicate. Communicate the gospel. We say we don't know what to say. You know, this type of reasoning still takes place in the church. I don't know what to say. Well, Paul didn't know what to say other than Christ crucified. You know, how we communicate that, that there, is, there is a God who created all of, all of humankind. And he is Holy. But he's also loving. He is a righteous judge, but he is also a, a graceful, loving father. That he will judge sin, but his desire is that everyone come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and 9, and not perish. Share that. One of the greatest evangelists of all time, 
and founder of the YMCA. Most people don't know this. It was D.L. Moody. And he had a very impactful but very unpolished ministry. One time after a service, a woman came to him and very respectfully said, Mr. Moody, this is D.L. Moody. <laughs> I noticed you made 18 grammatical mistakes in your sermon. <laughs> now, I would have my reaction, but Moody was much more elegant. He said, ma'am, I wouldn't have used that word, ma'am, <laughs> I'm using all the grammar I got for the Lord. What are you doing with yours? <laughs> he just preached. It was unpolished. Much of the, a lot of the time it was unpolished. But he used it for the Lord. We love to make excuses. But we have to recognize that God will equip us. The Lord Jesus encouraged his apostles, his disciples, and those of us in the church in Mark 13, verse 11, specifically that, that I will reveal to you through the person of the Holy Spirit who indwells all of us who have believed and are saved, he will reveal to you, to us, what you should say. That's God's command and promise. Preach the gospel, baptize, and trust that when those opportunities come our way, he will speak through us by the Holy Spirit. And that's what he's saying to Moses. But Moses responds by saying, send anyone you wish. You are the Lord, using the lesser name of God, Adonai, instead of Yahweh. Adonai, Send anybody else but me. Moses, as I say, I just, and I've already said this, was subtly, almost cryptically refusing to go. He will not go to Pharaoh because he, he probably assumed he was the one who was going to play the central and therefore primary role in the deliverance of the Israelites and how wrong he was. I'm going to tell you something that you already know. You can't save anyone. I don't have that power. You don't have that power. There's only one who has that power, and that is the Lord God. It is our role to be obedient. It is our role to exercise discernment. It is our role to share a loving word, the realities of a holy God, and reconciling that with the reality of a loving Savior. That's our role. And then you leave it. And you pray. And you follow up if opportunity presents itself. And you disciple. And you bring them, discipling, just bring them under your wing. Let them see your faults. Let them see your failures. Let them see you glorify the Lord even in your weakness. And Moses failed to realize it's God who is going to save his people. Back in Genesis 3 and 7, the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. These were Moses' kinsmen, but this, 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 the children of Israel were God's people. So as we close here, Moses' flat-out refusal, despite all the signs, you got a burning bush. It's not being consumed. God's numerous promises that he would be with Moses. He still refuses to go. And that's what angered the Lord. That burning anger toward him because Moses just didn't want to obey. But God again, even in his anger, shows grace. And that should give us hope. There are times we're going to anger God. He's going to be disappointed in his children, in a sense. But he shows us grace. Moses is going to be encouraged that his brother Aaron would be there. Aaron will support you, your brother. If you don't think you can speak Egyptian, he can. He's still there. And so he graciously provides him with helpers, with, with a support network to carry out this monumental task. First, his own presence, 
and it's the same for us. Next, the elders of Israel. We have the church family. And finally, here his brother Aaron will also carry the burden of what awaited Moses. And so we carry each other's burdens in life. Moses wasn't going to be alone, and neither are we in the church. And so we close with Reminding ourselves that we were first called to the kingdom of God. That is, when we were born again, we become part of that corporate body. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We repent of our sin and we believe upon him. We shall be saved. And we are born into a, a new relationship, a new, new spiritual life. And we become parts of a whole, the part of the church the majority of which has gone on to glory before us. And those of us who remain here, we still have work to do while it's still day. Moses was part of a whole which included the elders and his brother Aaron. And any such call, any pastoring or oversight or, or anything that, that we are called to needs to be confirmed by the whole. And so the church has a responsibility as Moses is going to have to gain the confidence of these men before he could carry on his task, likewise the church has a responsibility to play in the role of the particulars of how we carry out our tasks, each and every, every one of us. You know, as Christians, we have this great blessing of calling on the resources of the whole body of Christ to carry out our individual tasks. But the question is, are we resisting like Moses did? Well, despite his resistance and outright refusal to serve the Lord, God provided him with what he needed to be successful in his weakness. And a large part of that was community. And there are many today who now neglect the importance of church community. Well, with that lesson now clearly ingrained in his mind, Moses is anointed, equipped, Encouraged, and now, though he struggled, accepts the plan God has. A plan that included using Moses' weakness to bring out the Lord's glorious plan of salvation for his people. And so in verse 20, Moses took his wife, finally, and his son, and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. A practical reminder of the power of God. Anointed for service, plugged into his community. Now Moses is ready. And it was time for God to display his wonders. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you again for this morning that we could be together to worship you and to study your word. And to be challenged and to be encouraged. Father, forgive us in areas of our lives where we are resistant to your call or conformity to your word. We just pray now that you would forgive us. And then again, opportunity would arise for us to serve you for the glory of the Son. Father, we thank you for the example of Moses, both the negative and the positive. That at times, even though we are resistant and stiff-necked, you are gracious to equip us, even call us to salvation, and then to equip us for your service. What a God we serve. So we thank you for that this morning. And again, Lord, may we be challenged. May we be transformed. And may we be more like Jesus, the Lord, than we are like Moses at times. So, Father, continue to develop in us a heart like Christ that yearns to see others come to know salvation, to taste it and know that it is good. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to close our service singing a great hymn, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and we serve a wonderful, wonderful King of kings and Lord of lords. We worship him as we close our service this morning. Hymn number 10 in the hymn book, the words are on the screen. Won't you stand with me as we sing together?
just close in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you again now that we can come into your holy presence. And again, we recognize that it's by no righteous works of our own, that there's nothing that we can do to, to gain such an audience with the Most High God other than to confess Jesus is Lord. So we thank you now that Jesus is our King, our Lord, our Defender, our Sustainer. And then even now, Jesus is praying. The Lord Jesus is praying for us. We thank you for that. And when we don't know what to say, Lord, you have given us the presence of your Holy Spirit, that we can be equipped and empowered to live a holy life and to fulfill acts of service for your glory and for the continued advancement of the kingdom of heaven. Father, we pray that we would be as wise as serpent, uh, but as harmless as doves among a dead population in this world. Use us, we pray, for your glory. If there be any part of our soul or our person that is resistant, Lord, we pray that you would burn it away as the dross, that you would remove it, or tear down these strongholds of our own pride and arrogance, to think that somehow, God, you are deficient to use us. Though we are weak and frail, it is the glory and the power of God to use these broken earthen vessels to preach the word of God. So we thank you for that this morning and pray that you would use us. So Father, as we depart this Lord's Day, I pray that your face would shine upon each member of this church, everyone who calls Glenridge home, and all of those who are truly Christ's disciples. That your countenance would be lifted up and that we would sense your peace. And now, Lord, we pray. We pray fervently for the nation of Israel. And our Lord, such horrific acts toward your people are no strange thing. It is no surprise to see the empires of the world rallying against your chosen people. So, Father, we pray for a great protection and deliverance of those who have been taken hostage. And pray that you would move in a mighty and miraculous way as you did in the day of Moses, that many would see Jesus, that he is sovereign and Lord over all, and that these are his people, and this is his land to give to whom he decides to. So, Father, we pray now that you would bless that area and give wisdom and guidance to those who are involved in this conflict. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.